I'll focus today on left ventricular impellas and what the intensivist needs to know. The proper name for the impella is actually a microaxial flow pump. And it was basically invented by Abumet in Danvers, Massachusetts. And the name impella is actually a trade name. So I'll talk initially about the LV impella concept, the components of the impella, the contraindications first, and then I'll talk about the indications. I'll talk about the possible complications, some of the technical aspects and how to troubleshoot impellas, and then I'll end by talking about weaning. So how does an impella work? The impella is basically a catheter that sucks blood from the left ventricle and then propels it into the ascending aorta. I always like to explain it just like putting a straw down the LV, sucking out blood, pumping it up into the ascending aorta. The flexible pigtail is basically there to try to promote stability of the impella. Uh, it's also flexible so that it does not cause any myocardial injury, and it anchors the impella in a certain position. The effect of the impella when it sucks blood out of the LV and propels it into the ascending aorta is that it increases your mean aortic pressure, it increases your cardiac output, and with that, it will increase your coronary blood flow. But it also reduces your left ventricular and diastolic pressure because of that suction effect in the LV cavity. It reduces your pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, and it reduces your myocardial oxygen consumption. So it has a lot of beneficial effects in somebody with cardiogenic shock, especially if it's due to uh, coronary ischemia. What is the impella composed of? The impella is composed of a catheter that has an inflow port, and that is where blood gets sucked in. It has an outflow, which propels blood out into the ascending aorta, and then it has a flexible pigtail that anchors the impella in place. There's also a microaxial motor, and that microaxial motor is what works uh, to bring the blood up from the LV into the ascending aorta. And the way it works is like an Archimedes screw, and that handle of the screw is where the motor is housed. And so that handle should not have a clot sitting on it. Blood should not be mixing with that handle. And so your aim when you're running an impella is to prevent any blood from going into the microaxial motor. The optical sensor gives you aortic pressure and it gives you an estimate of the left ventricular pressure as well. The controller is called an automated impella controller or an AIC. And that gives you setup instructions for how to start up the impella it gives you pressures, aortic and left ventricular pressure. It gives you the motor power and how much motor power is being consumed to propel blood from the LV into the ascending aorta. And it also gives you a way to control performance or RPMs, and that is called the flow control. And then it gives you an indicator of how much actual flow is running by the impella. And then it also gives you an indicator of how much is being purged into the motor housing. How do you control flow with an impella? You control it with performance levels. And the performance levels, levels are denoted as P, and they go all the way from P0, meaning no uh, rotation and no RPMs, up to P9, which means the maximum amount of RPMs. And so the performance level, or P0 to P9, is controlled through this flow control button. And when you try to reposition the impella, the important thing is that you reduce the flow to P2 before you reposition the impella. Uh, and then once your position is satisfactory, you can increase the P level slowly to the desired flow. Now, depending on the size of the impella, P8 or P9 will give you pretty high flows. With a 5.5, it'll give you 5.5 liters of flow. With a 2.5, it'll give you close to 2.5 liters of flow. And with the impella CP, it'll give you close to 3.3 liters of flow. So the purge system is very important to keep blood out of the motor housing, out of that handle on the Archimedes screw. And so the purge system will have heparin. The standard concentration is D5 with heparin, 25 units per mil. It is acceptable to go up to 50 units per mil, but the standard concentration is 25 units per mil. An alternative, if somebody cannot be on heparin, would be to run a bicarb purge, 25 milliequivalents per liter. And so this bag of D5 with heparin will continuously be purged, controlled by the purge cassette, into the motor uh, to prevent blood from entering the motor. 
And so that continues to go regardless. One thing you need to bear in mind is that the purge flow will always be pumping heparin into the motor housing. This will eventually get to the patient. This will eventually get to the bloodstream. And that means that you are systemically heparinizing the patient just through the purge you're giving through the impella. So we see here that the purge flow was 7.8 mils per hour, roughly eight mils. If you multiply that by 25 units per mil, you're giving 200 units of IV heparin just by running the purge. So be mindful that you're systemically anticoagulating just by running the purge into the impella. Now, the impella pumps uh, come in different sizes and shapes. There's the impella 2.5 and the impella CP with smart assist. And both of these are inserted percutaneously. They need 13 French and 14 French cannulas to be inserted. They're usually inserted in the cath lab. And these are limited in how much flow they can give. There's also the, the surgical impellas, the impella 5.0, impella LD, impella 5.5 with smart assist. Uh, all of these are surgical impellas. And so the impella 5.0 uh, used to be widely available. And now most of us have moved to the impella 5.5 with smart assist. And all of these require larger bore cannulas. And so they require surgical access. Now, how do you put in an impella CP? An impella CP and an impella 2.5 is usually placed percutaneously, usually through the femoral uh, artery, uh, sometimes through the axillary artery. And the maximum flow an impella CP can give you is roughly around 3.5 to 3.7 liters per minute. The impella 5.5, on the other hand, is usually placed surgically, usually through the axilla. And it can also be placed directly into the ascending aorta in the OR, similar to a central balloon pump where they could, you could place it directly through the ascending aorta. The 5.0 is similar, and the impella LD is strictly put in surgically. And it's not used very often, but it can be put, put in like a central balloon pump as well. Now, mind you, most of us have moved to using either impella CPs for percutaneous access versus impella 5.5 for surgical access. And these two uh, are the best two that you want to have in your ICU. If you're starting to uh, adopt an impella program and you want to choose which pumps you want to get, I would choose for percutaneous access the, the impella CP and for surgical access, I would choose the impella 5.5. Now the maximum duration of use that is approved by the FDA is actually quite short. For the impella CP, for high risk PCI, it's less than six hours. For cardiogenic shock, it's less than four days. Uh, for the impella 5.5 and the other surgical impellas, it's about 14 days. This is all the FDA approved numbers, but I will show you shortly that most of us use impellas for much longer periods of time. And so, as I said, if you want to start a program, uh, the impella CP is the best percutaneous impella to have, and the impella 5.5 is the best surgical impella to have. And so how long can we use it? The FDA tells you 14 days at the most for the Impella 5.5. However, most of us have used Impellas for much longer. In fact, I refer to this uh, small single center cohort study of 69 patients, which broke down patients into two groups. Group A had a short-term use of less than 10 days. That was 39 patients. Group B had a long-term use of more than 10 days, and that was about 30 patients. The median duration of use in the short-term Impella was 6.0, uh, in the long-term impella, it was three weeks, 21 days, plus or minus 11. So some of these patients had impellas for 31 days. The mortality was not significantly different. It was, it was a limited study with small numbers, but it found no significant differences in the rates of complications between the short-term and the long-term impellas. But it was a very small study, so you really can't draw any conclusions about the complications. In fact, I think the more an impella stays in, the more prone you will be for complications. This study was somewhat underpowered. Now, there are, have been case reports and series that have used impellas for 45 to 90 days as a bridge to transplant. And so you can use impellas for much longer periods of time. So you have, say you have somebody who's listed for heart transplant and they're, they're waiting to get a heart. They can have the impella until they get the heart. As I said, there have been case reports of using impellas up to three months as a bridge to transplant. How are percutaneous impellas inserted? 
So percutaneous impellas are usually performed in the cath lab for cardiogenic shock or for high-risk PCIs as a protected PCI. If you have somebody with a low EF and you're scared that they may have uh, and they may have a, a low cardiac output syndrome or arrest during the PCI, you can do a protected PCI by putting in the impella first and then doing your coronary angiogram. The femoral artery is usually cannulated with ultrasound. The impella CP requires a 14 French sheath. The 2.5 requires a 13 French sheath. And then the impella placement can be under uh, fluoroscopic guidance. If you're in the cath lab, usually that's what they would do. Or it can be under TEE guidance as well. Once the impella CP is in place, what you want is to confirm that the impella tip is three centimeters from the aortic annulus. Three centimeters from the aortic annulus plus or minus 0.5. And so anywhere from 2.5 to 3.5 for the impella CP. And so here you see the best view to look at an impella is the parasternal long axis view. And there you see the impella. It gives you two white, bright hyperechoic lines. We call that the railroad track. What you want to do is freeze that image and then take a look at the distance from the aortic annulus all the way down to the tip of the railroad track. And you want that to be about three centimeters, plus or minus 0.5 for the percutaneous impellas. Surgical impellas, on the other hand, including the 5.5 and the 5, are usually inserted in the OR. Usually they're put in by surgical cut down on the subclavian artery, and then a prosthetic graft is sewn on the subclavian artery and then tunneled for better stability. And then the impella guide wire and the final placement can also be under either fluoroscopic guidance or TE guidance. In the OR, a lot of times we'll use TE to guide impella placement. For the surgical impellas, the final confirmation with echo should show that the tip of the impella is 4.5 centimeters from the aortic annulus. 4.5, give or take 0.5. So anywhere from four to five centimeters from the aortic annulus. The surgical impellas usually don't have a pigtail. So you have a little bit more room to go, and it should be a little bit deeper from the aortic annulus with the surgical impellas. And so here is how we would confirm that the uh, guide wire is going in the right place. Uh, this is a mid long axis view. And what you see is the guide wire is still in the, in the aortic root. The guide wire has not crossed the aortic annulus. And then as they advance the guide wire, the guide wire is now crossed the aortic valve. And then here you can see that the guide wire is a little bit more comfortably inside the left ventricular outflow tract. And then here we have put down the impella down the guide wire, and we see that the impella is in reasonable position. What we need to do now is freeze that image and measure the distance uh, from the aortic annulus to the tip of the railroad track. And that distance here is showing us 5.38. So it's a little bit on the deeper side. It should be 4.5 plus or minus 0.5 below the aortic valve. So what I would do in this situation is just make sure the mitral valve is looking good, flows are looking good, end organ perfusion is looking good. And if everything is looking good, then this is okay. I would accept 5.3, even though it's a little bit more than five centimeters, which my, is my upper limit of normal. But I would say, as long as it's not giving you trouble, leave it alone. Perfect is the enemy of good. This is good, and so just leave it alone. And then you do an x-ray. Uh, the x-ray I find is usually less useful because it doesn't show you the relationship from the aortic annulus. Uh, and then you would confirm placement by looking at the screen and making sure you see an aortic tracing and an LV tracing. This is only available with the impellas with a smart assist. Now, the impellas with a smart assist are the impella CP for percutaneous and the impella 5.5 for surgical. And you should also see that the motor power is fluctuating, and that depends on the native contractility. And at the end, once your impella is in good position, you would like to screw the 2E lock in place so that it does not move in and out. There are centimeter markings along the catheter, and there's a sterile sheath, and you want to note how deep the impella is, uh, and then make sure that it doesn't rock in and out, it doesn't move in and out, make sure 
that it is in good position and locked in place. How do you make sure that uh, placement is correct using the smart assist setup? Signs of correct placement include that the aortic placement signal reads an aortic pressure. So that red line it reads an aortic pressure. You can see here 96 on 72, that indicates that it is in the ascending aorta. But then when you look at the LV placement signal, you will see that it is giving you a, an estimated ventricular pressure. You see here that the diastolic is much lower. It's reading 98 on, on 14. So this is an estimated left ventricular pressure. However, it's only estimated. It's not measured. And it shows only when you're running at a value of P4 and above. Then you should look at the motor and the motor current should be pulsatile. And this depends on the native contractility. So how does it assess or how does it estimate LV pressure? It estimates the LV pressure through the smart assist feature, which is available in the Impella CP and the Impella 5.5. The smart assist feature basically looks at the aortic pressure that it actually measures and subtracts the pressure gradient. The pressure gradient is derived from the motor current. These fluctuations in the motor current can give you an estimate of the pressure gradient. And so if you subtract the pressure gradient from the aortic pressure, it'll give you an estimate of the LV pressure. And this is called the smart assist feature. In cases of low flows, when you have flows of P4 or less, or in cases of low native heart pulsatility, the smart assist will not be able to work. And so it will not be able to estimate LV pressures if you have lower flows or if you have less pulsatility on the motor tracing, in which case you would confirm position using the patient hemodynamics and with echocardiography. And so, as I said, this is just an estimate and it only works if you have pulsatility and if you have a performance level of P4 or greater. Now, you all notice that the impella pumps have a bend. There's a bend, a 30 degree bend in the impella pump. Now, why was it built with a 30 degree bend? It, the purpose was to orient the catheter towards the apical antraceptal LV, away from the posterolateral lateral wall of the LV. Why is that? It's because the postural lateral wall of the LV is where the mitral subvalvular apparatus is. And so you don't want the impella tip to encroach on the mitral subvalvular apparatus and get tangled in the corda and impair mitral valve function. And so that's why it has that 30 degree bend uh, in order to orient it away from the postural lateral wall. And you can only see this usually on echo. And so you see here that that 30 degree bend is uh, pointing upwards. It's not bending backwards. It's pointing up towards the anteroceptal wall. It's not bending backwards towards the postural lateral wall. So this is good position of an impella. Now, a lot of times while they're positioning it, they'll have to rotate the impella quite a bit in order to get that favorable position. And if the impella does get caught in the mitral apparatus, it can cause restricted opening or closing, in which case you would need to advance the catheter deep into the ventricle to disengage from the mitral valve apparatus, to disengage from the cord tendony. And once you're deep enough, you need to rotate the catheter and then pull back again. And so that's what happens if you find that the pigtail is getting caught in the cord tendony or the mitral valve apparatus. If it gets caught, it can cause either restricted opening of the mitral valve, uh, which will give you mitral stenosis, or restricted closing, which will give you mitral regurgitation. So it's important when you're assessing impella position to interrogate the mitral valve, make sure that you're not impeding mitral valve function with the pigtail being encroached in the mitral valve apparatus. And to deal with it, as I said, you need to advance the impella deeper to disengage and then rotate the catheter to the correct orientation.